Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Biz Dev Live. I have the amazing Tonil Miller on with me today. We're going to be talking about doing good by doing well, optimizing your company, your employee experience, talking about how important it is to have that focus. And now, and this time, you're hearing stories about Amazon and unions and uh, even from the small company standpoint of the challenge of bringing employees into your organization, how important is it to optimize what you're doing, what you're doing with your staff, what you're doing with yourself. We're gonna get into all that and more right after the BizDev theme. Be right back. BizDev Live, BizDev Live. Weekdays at 11 Eastern Time Live. BizDev Live, BizDev Live. Weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Leadership and motivation, motivation, empathy and inspiration, inspiration. Biz Dev Live, Biz Dev Live, business development, not even selling it. Biz D with C, brought to you by Cameron T, Cameron T. Biz D with C, brought to you by Cameron T, Cameron T. This is business development, not even selling it, not even selling it, not even selling this it. This is business development, not even selling it. Business development, not even selling it. Biz Dev Live, Biz Dev Live. Biz Dev Live. This is business development, not even selling it. Hey, everybody. All right. I got Tanil on the show. Tanil is a global transformation operative, a people experience leader who has spent her career in the large consulting firms, as well as startups and large multinationals, advising and partnering with leaders to operationalize their business strategy through the optimal performance of their people and organizations. Her focus is on digital transformation, change management, hybrid work, culture, talent strategy, employee experience, leadership development, organizational effectiveness, and strategic communications. Please welcome to the show, the tenacious Tanil Miller. Hi, Cameron. Thanks for having me. So excited to have you on the show. Thanks for setting this up. Uh, I know you're going to offer a lot of good value. Uh, what, how do you help people right now? And then we'll get into the backstory here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you covered most of it in your introduction. So lots of words there that you had to spit out. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started my own consulting firm, as you mentioned, called EXT Experience and Transformation. And as a consulting firm, we provide, um, like you said, startups through large multinational clients, um, all those different topics that you mentioned. So consulting on engagement experience, basically all things that are at the intersection of your people and or transformation in the organization, as we all know right now, especially that is happening all over the place and so we're very busy love that yeah there's a lot of a lot of transformation going on we're looking at i mean getting the st stories in good morning jason let us know where you're tuning in from you're watching the show right now let us know where you're tuning in from i always love to know where everybody's tuning in from thank you for, so much for getting into those comments asking the questions um i know we're gonna have a great conversation around all of the pieces of the puzzle, especially that we're seeing out in the news, because it's just nonstop uh, barrage of changes in the work environment, work from home versus uh, working in the office, uh, the, the challenges that so many of these global now companies are having in terms of retaining. And so, you know, what are some of the lessons that entrepreneurs, small business owners can take from some of the, the larger uh, struggles. Jason tuning in from Colorado land there. Um, so talk to me about, you know, because I'm really interested in your motivation, why you got into this work. What did, what did little Tonia want to be when she was growing up and how did that get us to here? Yeah. I mean, I think unlike a lot of people that go into law, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. I think a lot of people kind of get pushed into that from their parents. Um, I actually wanted to be a lawyer from as little as I can remember, like four years old. And I, I didn't know why then. I just I think I thought that lawyers made a lot of money. They got to advise other people and be an expert and kind of lead people and guide people. And I loved school. So that was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, but 
there was, you know, I think one of the main things for me is that, you know, when I was young, I experienced a lot of adversity as a child, um, but it really helped form my foundation, like my perseverance, my confidence, and then, you know, really my, my confidence in myself and that ability to flourish regardless of the adversity in the situation. Um, so I'll just back up a little bit, but I mean, a couple of things, you know, that kind of color my childhood is that, you know, I was, first of all, I was born handicapped and told I would never walk. Um, both my legs, you know, there was issues and I had to have all kinds of surgeries and, you know, over and over and over, my mother would take me to all kinds of doctors. And finally, she found an amazing man at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And he said, well, I have an experimental surgery that hasn't been tried on anybody yet. And if you're willing to let me try it, you know, it certainly could make this all go away. And so wonderfully, he did. And then so once he did all these surgeries, I ended up spending a lot of my childhood in hip to toe casts and you know the whole thing. So there's that whole thing that kind of kicked off life. But it really now I'm fine. Everything is healed. Everything is great. I can dance, run, do everything anyone else can. And I think for me, the lesson there has always been like, wow, if I can walk, right? And I wasn't supposed to, that's just one lesson, one gift. I mean, what else can I do, right? What else can I do that people say I can't? Um, so that's kind of one of my first memories or first milestones, I think. And then, you know, along with that, I was born into a very blue collar household. Um, parents divorced when I was four. And after that, dad was rarely there physically and definitely not there financially. And so I watched my mother from as young as I can remember almost really have to juggle like three or four jobs at a time, jobs she didn't even like, but she had to pay the bills and make ends meet. And so I think that also colored my my lens as well. Um, and then, you know, that, that home became a very dysfunctional um, and chaotic environment, right? And so with that, I think now looking back, I also learned very early on how to function in a high level way and lead others since I was really parenting my parents parents, parenting my brother from a very young age, and kind of leading others in those uncomfortable, ambiguous, uncertain environments instead of being scared of them and scared of change, which just plays into what I do now. Um, I got very comfortable very early on doing it. And again, like I said, guiding people. So I think that those are some of the things in my childhood that I look back now and I'm like, whoa, that's really what has kind of made me do what I'm doing now. Um, Another piece I would probably throw in there is that, you know, school was really, as I mentioned, I loved school, right? Like it was that one place where I felt seen and I could really transcend that immediate home situation. And maybe some of your viewers have had those experiences as well, um, where it's like there's school or there's a job or there's some outlet that like, wow, this actually shows me a window. Maybe they have a mentor and it shows like a window into what could be that's not their immediate life. Um, and so I found in school very quickly, I really graduated or gravitated towards psychology. And I think part of it is subconsciously I just was very good at it intuitively because I was trying to understand my family dynamics and all of those things back home. And so for some reason, I just gravitated toward it. So definitely um, really focused on that for most of, you know, high school, college, put myself through college, grad school um, and all that. And just became a real astute observer of people and kind of started to be able to predict those interpersonal dynamics that would take place. Right. And like predict what they would do next and really try to get in front of it and be very strategic and objective in that way. And so I, I bring all that up to say that now looking back again, a lot of those experiences lend themselves absolutely perfectly to what I'm doing because all of that comes into play in organizational behavior, managing change and transformation, guiding other people, coaching them, that sort of thing. So that's just a little bit of my backstory to get us started. I, I love that. And I mean, you know, the communication, the challenges, I, I think, you know, running a company and you try not to be patronizing, right? You never mm -hmm. want to treat another adult like a child. But as you're going through the family struggles, right? And mm -hmm. you were talking about it. Um, I'm usually thinking about, you know, lessons that I take from work home with me and teach my children, lessons that my children have taught me that I bring to the, the workplace. And you're talking about, you know, lessons that you learned as a child trying to sort of manage up, mm -hmm. right? And I, I talk a lot about that, you know, with, with staff. And then sometimes you're in these situations, you're working with a client mm -hmm. and you have to manage those expectations. Yeah. You need to lead, even though you're supposed to be following, you need to be able to learn how to lead, right? So you get a lot of those um, lessons in the family. I certainly try to you know, give the home training to my children so that they understand how to uh, develop relationships with the leaders in their environment, with teachers, with uh, people in their life, so that when they get into this this place where they're going to be working with other adults, mm -hmm. and they understand 
what these relationships should look like, how people need to be treated, especially if they're gatekeepers, right? Which mm -hmm. is what a teacher is to me, right? It's a gate gatekeeper, whether yeah. you like the teacher, how they work with you or not, it's it's that. And mom and dad are, are gatekeepers, yeah. right? They're very much so gatekeepers, right? So yeah. you've got to learn how to manage that. I, I love that story. And, and crazy that, you know, you, you, you certainly don't take uh, walking for granted right after having no. experience. And we talk about gratitude on this show mm -hmm. and not taking stuff for granted all the time. So I, I, lo I love where your head is at. With your, with your journey, you've, you've kind of, you know, kind of moved on up. So what was some of the, the, the lessons that you were taking from the home into corporate life with you? And, and how did that play out? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and again, I didn't know it necessarily at the time. I mean, I definitely know it now. I probably knew it somewhat then, but um, I think some of the things that I mentioned were key, right? So first of all, just really being able to read other people's behaviors. And I think when I was young, it was for a survival mechanism, right? I had to be predicting what's going to happen. Are things going to get scary tonight? Um, and so I just intuitively became always just acutely aware of like, to the point where literally I'm not saying I can read people's thoughts, but you know, I'll be in a room with someone. And I think I just have such a high degree of empathy that I've developed over the years from those situations where I can probably tell exactly what they're thinking just by sitting next to them or looking at their, looking in their eyes and understand, like just gauging them. Um, so I think that's very helpful. Um, that's been super helpful. Um, and I think again, just the things that you mentioned, you know, just learning how to manage up and to your point, you brought this up and this is, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is very much a thing where um, our dynamics and our, our family family dynamics and especially the parental relationship very much mirrors the workplace and like you said school as well because it's that gatekeeper thing and so I find that a lot of people now and I'll see it play out in work where they're actually um they're coming to me with a situation about their colleague or their manager or whatever and you can tell once you dig a little deeper and ask a couple questions like oh that was a childhood wound where their mom used to do x y or z and it meant this thing over here and so now when their manager does something that kind of looks like that they project it onto them and they think that that's and they get very very scared and anxious and more so than they would need to and it's because there's all those wounds underneath it and so i think all those things really the, the, the dynamics are very similar and they play out uh, and vice versa so yeah that's yeah. what i see yeah. have you dived into brene brown's work at all oh yes yep yeah, yeah. So that this this rings true for anybody that's like, you know, meeting people where they are, right? Mm -hmm. right? And talking about because we bring everything with us, and it's not like yes. we can. I think the I don't know if you've seen this show or anybody that's watching has seen the show Severed on Apple. It's a very interesting uh, dynamic, but they basically have, you know, in that show the premise is that they're able to separate the the mind so that you are who you are outside of work. And you are who you are inside of work, but the, it, it never meets, right? Wow. So you don't have any memory of life outside of work when you're at work. And when you're outside of work, you don't have any memory of anything that happened inside of work. It's a really interesting. Sounds story, like it. Right. Because yeah. obviously it's, it's complete fiction. I mean, it's just, it's not something, but it, it's, I think the, the battle with the show is that, even with them splitting the brain that way, you know, the, the other half is always wondering what the other half is doing. Yeah. But so it's not, even though it's, it's completely separate, it, it can't be right. It's just, no. you know, I, I, I live, there's another life happening outside of work. And while I'm at work, I'm thinking about that life. And when I'm not at work, I'm thinking about, you know, so it's, it's a really fun uh, parallel of, of the idea that, you know, obviously we bring everything everywhere we go and here's, you know, where they, the solution. But yeah. And I think that that's one of the topics too. I think just to interject there is that well, yeah. I think that's how our workplaces had been designed. And some people right. thought they were operating that way for a very long time. Like I leave work at work, I go home. Cause we, before the pandemic, before we worked, we, both, too, right, yeah. we had the delineation, at least for some people, we still took work. But, but to your point, we bring that backpack with us to both of them and we are full humans. And so when I go to work, if I am, um, you know, a member of a, a minority group or I'm a member of this or whatever that is coming with me whether you see it or not whether you can tell that I have this childhood or this background or whatever that's coming with me and then when I go home at night and I'm with my family I'm still thinking about that meeting and that horrible experience that I had with that colleague earlier so to your point like I'm going to watch that show it sounds fantastic because we can't um, compartmentalize them even though we think we can yeah I love that and and so talk to you know, a little bit of it because you you did work at some of these big you know powerhouse consultant firms, KPMG, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, 
uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about how some of those insights and you're, I mean, working as a female and, you know, diving into the work with, yeah. with Brene Brown, working as a female in these heavily male dominated industries, how did some of this kind of being able to sort of see what was going on in the room play out for you? Obviously you had some success and you were able to deal with it. What were some of the strategies? Cause I think some of the folks that might be watching would love to know, you know, how they, how you coped and how you dealt with and, you know, when a challenge arose, you know, how did you deal with that challenge? Yeah, I, I love that you brought this question up. I don't get asked this that often. Um, and so not only did I work in those firms, but, you know, again, it's like professional and financial services, very male dominated. A lot of my clients were in the financial services industry. Um, and then also I live and work in New York City. So all that together, you can imagine a really fun experience for a woman if she's not completely secure in herself, if she's not strong, if she doesn't have um, that strong sense of self and, and really understanding how to speak up for herself, negotiate for herself. And, and it's a real fine line. And we could talk all day about this topic specifically, but I know the show isn't about this, but hopefully you have some female watchers um, or just the males that are very um, enlightened and they want to learn we as well. Do, we do. Right. The, color, the, the color invites the ladies in. Right. Of course. I, I get that. I love that. Well, and so here's what I would say. I would say that um, I think I had a lot of experience in from a very young age, when I was younger, I was modeling and doing all kinds of things like that. And I bring that up because that's also a situation where that coupled with, oh, well, now you're going to go to grad school and think that you're smart and like all those different comments and things that might come out of situations like that from some people. Um, I had to um, kind of address those head on from a very young age to the point where I'm like, no, I just happen to do this modeling thing on the side because it's a fun outlet. I'm not, that's not me. I'm actually a brain. I have a brain. I have personality. I have all these things. And so I think from a very young age, I just learned to be um, very strong, have a strong sense of self, um, and just not let that stuff get in. And, and I can talk about for various reasons why that happened, but I think for various experiences when I was younger, I was able to really cultivate that extremely strong sense of self and understand who I am, what my bar is, what I'm going for, and put and just project it so strongly out there that people don't see I'm a woman or they don't see this or that, or they may see it, but then once they work with me, I can pretty much shut it down right away. And so I, I guess to answer your question in a very long winded answer is I really led and lead with that. What is my mission? I'm not swayed by you trying, you know, I, I don't get swayed by people trying to um, give you accolades or whatever. And I don't get swayed by people giving me criticism. I take all of it as a learning. I take all of it in and I think about what's important to keep and what's important to just let it go. And just leading with that, like leading with your purpose as a woman, leading with your goals in mind, um, leading with, again, your intelligence and all the great things and really projecting that out as your brand, no matter what situation you're in and no matter what someone else tries to project on you. And I think I got that too. Like I said, from a young age, being put in different boxes very quickly and early as all of us are in various realms. And I just didn't like it. And I'm like, I'm not that. You don't know that. You don't know me. So I just, I, now I'm very strong in that projection of like, this is who I am. This is my mission. And this is what I came to do. Yeah, and so I, think I, hope everybody, that helps. I think everybody deals with some forms of microaggressions. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, as you're, as you move away from the pole position of the white male, you deal with more and more and more depending on what your status and how you're viewed in society where you are mm -hmm. and it's tough it's a tough thing i know i've spoken to several women of color that it is just it's it's incredibly draining mm -hmm. it's like another job on top of your job the the, the microaggressions the uh the the doubt you know, the, the doubt. And then, and then of course, battling because we all have doubt. And yeah. so when people are uh, questioning you, of course, that opens it up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Cross says, I love that strength. So there, yeah, there. you have to do a lot of inner work on that one. I'm not telling anyone what to do, but for me, I think what's done it is like, I've always had to rely on myself more than mm -hmm. I always not saying I couldn't rely on other people, but no matter what I knew, I could always rely on myself. And so that was first and foremost. And so I did, a, I've done a lot of, and I continue to do it. You know, it's all the podcast, the reading, watching shows like this, reading inspirational stories, and just really doing that inner work to know who you are. And I think that it's really hard and it takes a lot of time, but once you do that, you're unshakable. Mm -hmm. Nobody, no matter what they say to you can actually puncture that uh, strong sense of self. And so I think if I was to give anyone advice, no matter what age you are, no matter what uh, gender, you know, great, doesn't matter 
do that inner work. So you're really clear on who you are. So it's not like on one hand where, you know, when people say X, Y, or Z, or try to put you in a box, you're like, Oh God, am I that? Cause I know people that they're that, I don't want to use the word weak, but they're that uh, fragile. Their, their sense of self is that fragile that they let that stuff impact them. And I understand because it's hard. I've had those situations too. But then I see on the other end of the spectrum where it's almost like um, it's an arrogance where they didn't do the strong sense of self work. So internally they don't have that strong sense of self, but they act arrogant out here because they're uh, protecting that part of it it's like a defense mechanism so i think it's a real fine line in the middle where you're confident but you're not you all know those managers that are projecting strength but are very insincere mm -hmm. um, on the on the inside Nas yeah. national leaders sometimes right we, we get mm -hmm. all of that all that good stuff yeah. <laughs> yeah all right so let's let's get into some of these these talking points right some of these uh takeaways for people here mm -hmm. um you talk about optimizing the experience people have with your organization, right? And yeah. the impact that has. Talk to me a little bit about some of the work that you've done, some of the results that you've seen and how people can actually implement it within their enterprises. Yeah, so I'll kind of, I'll walk us back one step and then I'll head there if that's okay. Um, just a little more background that might help people of like, oh, how did I start here? So the other part I think to address here is that my first real job out of college was actually as a behavior change researcher at a workplace well-being and productivity company. So it's like a, a company back in Minnesota that would conduct research and do consulting services and build programs for large Fortune 500 companies um, to basically mitigate healthcare costs, right? So obesity and all these horrible healthcare costs are out there and it's like people are getting less healthy, they're costing more, et cetera. So this organization did all the research and built programs to where we realized like what things we could target and what interventions we could do to actually increase people's health, to increase um, their mental well-being at work and that sort of thing, their productivity and all that. And so that was like, I did it because I was really interested in health and psychology and behavior change, but I just fell in love with it because of what I realized in that journey of not just what we were doing specifically, but it was my first like entree into understanding all the different organizational levers and the environment and all and the people at work. And of course your home, but especially at work, um, those things that really have a huge impact on any behavior, not just health behavior, any behavior, any like stress levels and your productivity and all that. And so that was kind of my first foray in. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. And then I thought, well, if we figured out how to do that, right? And behavior change and all those different things we just talked about, then how do we get people to be happy at work, right? So the big question is like, how do I get employee engagement? How do I get people to be happy? How does this happen? How do I get that extra discretionary effort? So then I went on to another consulting firm in which I study that. That was what the work that I did as a consultant is really doing the employee engagement research. And I just found it so fascinating. And I just started seeing these, what I call them is like those puzzle pieces I'm picking up in the organization and all the different change levers that we can be pulling um, to make Make life or to make a, a life at work better for people, right? Because they're spending so much time at work. Whether it's what, what, were COVID. The, what were some of the highlights of that? What, what were some of the things that you were saying? Seeing, like, I mean, I think it's also interesting to kind of point out some of the things that might not have been working too, just as a you know, yeah, lay out the dichotomy, right? Yep, definitely. And there's some things that I'll be diving in a little bit, a little bit more in detail, but essentially it's a lot of the, the same levers that I now employ in my work. And it's things like your direct manager that makes or breaks your, your, your time at work, your experience at work, right? So a lot of this is all employee experience stuff that we'll get into as well, but your manager, uh, the environment. So I'll just give you a quick example. So in the health example, it was like, if you have junk in the vending machines and you don't make it like a, a big, like a, like a ritual for people to go for a walk after lunch. And if you expect them to, you know, shove their lunch in their mouth at their desk and work 24 seven, and you know, you're, you're piling on the stress at home. If you're doing all this stuff, those are very detrimental, right? To productivity, to mental health, to well being, all that stuff. And that's why you see the healthcare costs going up. So those are some things in just that particular setting. Um, and then you see when you, when it comes to, well, let, me, let me, let me pause there. Cause I think those are, yeah. those are great things, right? Because you're talking about, the messages that you're sending, right? You mm -hmm. may be saying in terms of company policy, we yeah. want you to be healthy. Yeah. We want you to be well rested. We yeah. want you to show up to work motivated. But then what do the breaks look like? Yeah. What is what is the food available? Yeah. Is, it, is it a food, is it a, a healthy food desert, right? The leaders role model and say, hey, let's go out for a walk for this walking meeting. Right. Right. And then, like and I think the thing that you said that was most important, because, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, right, everyone's direct reporting to you. So you are the manager that we're mm -hmm. speaking of in the sense of who is your direct manager. A lot of entrepreneurs, me included, have been in this place where, you know, I'm busy. 
I got, I got yeah. a lot of things to do, so I don't necessarily have time to coach you or walk you through. But if I want this person to show up, and, and I think it's a common uh, entrepreneurial complaint that, oh, this person doesn't show up and do the same job that you know I do. They yeah. don't get the same. They don't uh, hustle like me. They don't grind all day like me. Yeah. What What are you feeding them? What kind of what What are you What What are you giving them? Right. And I and I love I love that you're pointing that out because if you want your folks that are working with you, your virtual assistants, your team, whatever that team looks like to be productive, yeah. what are you put, what are you putting into that relationship? And I love Gary V's line on this, yeah. which is not that they work for you. The, it's that the reverse is true. You work for them. You want them to lift up your company. You want them to help scale, grow, expand, fulfill. The, you need to be there for them. I, I, I love that piece of it. So I'm glad you called that out. Yeah. And I think just for your audience specifically too, the other thing is, and again, I'm an entrepreneur too, but here's the deal. After doing this work for so many years and practicing it, I, I also practice all these things on myself as well. I don't think hustle culture is good. I don't think burnout and like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grinding all day. That's not good. And in fact, I would say that we should probably only be working about three to five hours a day. I don't care if you're an owner of a company. I don't care if you're an entry level employee. I think it's like three to five hours a day is the max we should be working because if we're strategic about what we're doing and we're not reacting all day, I think all that I'm sitting at my desk for 16 hours, I think that's a lot of reactionary, non productive work and it's a law of diminishing returns and it's not sustainable. So I would caution all these entrepreneurs in your audience think about what are those like, top five things or top three things that are going to move the needle 80% and put all your energy there and knock those suckers out right away. And then just let everything else fall. Because you know what, if it's important enough, it'll, it'll eventually make its way into that bucket. But don't be this reactionary, like I'm wearing my badge on my sleeve of like, you know, burnout and working all the time. Because I used to be that person too. And I realized it's not helping anybody. And then again, to that point, Cameron, it, it really, your people, if you have one employee or 25 employees or 25,000 employees, they everything you do as a leader, whether you think they're watching or not, you think they're listening or not, they are just like kids and their parents. They see everything. And so if you say to them, oh, I know I'm the leader. It's OK, though. I'll work weekends all the time and I'll be sending you emails on the weekend. But you don't have to. I know it sounds nice, but once you do that more and more and more, they're going to be working all weekend long as well. So you just need to really keep that top of mind as a leader. Yeah, I love that. And I think. For me, in my own experience, you know, I have struggled with this because you know I, I work and I work from home. And so already you have those blurred lines between what is the work day and when is home time. And it's a constant struggle to make sure that you're spending time with family and that, you know, the, the work day does end. It doesn't just bleed right, you know, into, all right, I go to bed, I get up and I'm right back at it. And I think a big learning or light bulb moment for me as the the boss, as as the leader is, you know, very much to, to what you said, you know, about five hours, having a really productive morning is important for me, having that routine, getting a major uh, piece towards my long-term goal versus things that are just the work of the organization, right? If I'm if I'm focused on answering emails all morning, am I getting the long-term strategic, really important, uh, you know, traction, momentum building pieces done, or am I just focused on busy work? Cause you can just work on that busy work, work, mm -hmm. work, 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 work into the night. I've done it time and time again. I'll probably do it some more, especially as I'm rebuilding my company, no. I'm doing it, you know, but, but, you know, I'm also trying to be strategic and focus on, you know, like a business coach hiring, people within my means, within my budget, but hiring people to take care of tasks so that I can spend more of my time on the things that are most important that I most enjoy within the job, within the work, within the business, and letting other people do what they're amazing at and working on getting people that are a lot better than me and letting go of that ego too, which I think is a big thing. And I, I was just uh, with a me mechanic uh, guy that, that I work with very often down the street and it was interesting as he was saying nobody could do what i do you know uh, you know i, I hired and and of course what, what does he ask what is he thinking that they're going to do what well, he's thinking they're going to work the same hours that he's going to work mm -hmm. that they're going to have he's going to have that they're going to have the same relationships that he has with the customers and it's just 
unrealistic expectations, right? And so you're never going to optimize the experience for not only the, the the staff that you have, but for your clients. Because mm-hmm. if you get down to those brass tacks, what you're doing probably isn't that amazing. You mm-hmm. can systemize it, you can process it. And at the end of the day, you know, giving a custom price to every client probably isn't the best idea for your business and for your clients, right? You know, I think it's just one of those things that, you know, once you can get over yourself, it's like, oh, oh, this works better now. I get it. (laughs) Yep. That's where doing the work comes in. Because again, I mean, I know I had more of an ego and not that I don't have one now, but I think over the years you have to do that work. And then you realize, oh, that was just my ego thinking that I had to be the one to do all of it. But guess what? I was killing myself on the side and I wasn't happy then. So I think as entrepreneurs, I mean, it's one thing if you just love doing the work, hey, good, go do it, own it, but own it. And don't make other people have to work that hard just because you love to work that hard. You know what I mean? So I think it's just knowing yourself is really important. So what do you want to get into? We could. Uh, do you want to get into, you can do good uh, by doing well or do you want yeah. to do into, Yeah, all right, let's go. I think so because I think, you know, the thing is for me is like, that's just really my philosophy. And I think I can pull into that, you know, some examples and some of the things that we were going to talk about through that lens, if that works. Yeah, please. Yeah. So this is just, I mean, this is not new, this doing well and doing good. I think Howard Schultz from Starbucks brought up this a long time ago, but essentially the way that I see it is I think a lot of leaders think of it as like a zero sum game, right? So it's either my people or my profits. It's my company is successful or my people love me, or, you know, it's one or the other. And I just feel like it's, it's not only not that, but it's both and right. And so the way that I I think about it is like, if you're very strategic about it, If you focus on the people first, right, they're the foundation and think of that, whether it's one person or again, 100,000 people that work for you, if that's your foundation, and that's where you invest most of your time and energy and your inspirational activities and all that stuff, then they all drive your business forward versus you spending all that time trying to drive and grind that business forward. And then they're leaving you every five minutes, you have people leaving you and then you're having to deal with the churn because you're not focused on them. And so why not, you know, empower them and give them those tools that they need to drive your business for you. And guess what? They're going to have a better experience too, because they're going to feel like they're part owners, which is wonderful. Netflix is very good at doing this. Um, And so the way that I think of how we do that is, you know, we can optimize that experience that our people have. Um, And then they serve as like that flywheel, right? They take care of all that for us. And so I'll just kind of go through my framework that I put together really quickly for this. Um, First, you start with your business goals, right? So no matter what size your company is, or even if you're just an individual, right? You're thinking about, you know, your, your kids as your business or whatever that is. You think about what is the organization's goals, right? What are we trying to achieve? And then we think about what is our organizational strategy, that actually operationalizes us to get to those goals, right? So you think about those things, then you walk backwards and you say, well, what do I need? What like talent and skills and capabilities do I need in the company to drive the strategy that will achieve those goals? And guess what? That's your people. And what do you need to make sure they're doing everything and flourishing and bringing the best versions of themselves and driving your organization forward? You need a great employee experience and a great culture and, you know, great change management, things like that. So that while they're at work, we're removing any friction from their day. Um, We're making sure that they have all the tools they need to be successful, whether it's psychological or technology tools, whatever that is. And then they really bring it forward for you. So that's kind of the framework of how I think about how this doing good and doing well works. And then as a bonus, as a leader, you're going to feel great because you're, you know, at the end of the day, you're doing well by your people. And then you know that that's kind of like an investment and that's going to pay off. And then they're going to drive your goals forward. So I'm going to pause there. That's just kind of like a high level. I I think think it it speaks to the the ethics piece. Right. And so, you know, I think, you know, for folks, you know, that, that might think ethics are wonky, but we, we are looking for that everywhere we go. Right. You know, I, I think, you know, in a world you know, and Amazon is in, in the news for, for unions and all this stuff. But I love the business model of Amazon because when you go on to a product, it's it's just democratized in the sense that you're seeing all these reviews. And so mm-hmm. you're seeing people's opinions of the product. And so you get a sense of, is this something that other people liked, enjoyed? There's an ethical piece to yeah. that. You might not hold you accountable. Right. You, you don't you may not love the ethics of the, the parent company, what, what they're doing and some of the other, other things. But the reason that we buy from Amazon, the reason that they've grown and, and because some of these other issues exist is because the ethics of the situation. And so we do that as consumers. Um, I love, um, 
you brought up Howard Schultz. And so he's stepped back in as CEO. And I don't know about other folks watching this, but if, if, if their reaction was anything like mine, it was like a breath of fresh air as he came back and said, yeah, we're going to pause this whole stock buyback thing of putting all these billions of dollars into benefiting stockholders who aren't doing the day-to-day -day work of the company and producing the results mm -hmm. for the stockholders, but actually put it back into the people that are serving the coffee and actually doing the work that's built this amazing company and this amazing brand. And that felt, you know, that felt good when I read it. I was like, hey, that's, that seems more on the call it ethics, call it on heart, call it compassion. That seemed the right thing to do. Yeah. And it will be long term too. That's the thing is like, I think it's a very short game when leaders are like, oh, well, we're having bad, you know, financial quarters. So we're going to lay off a bunch of people. And I know that that's been a thing since the eighties. That's when that started. And then, buy, and then buy stock. So the stock goes up. Yeah. And then we, the, the funny part is, is like, not only is that horrible just for morale and all that and your brand and what, what have you, but like, it's really expensive. I don't know if anyone's seen the data, but like when, an employee leaves, I think you have to spend at least one and a half times what they were making to find someone else. And that's if you're lucky and you do that over and over, no one's going to work for your company. And so I just feel like it's really the short game to do that as a leader. I, I absolutely agree. I think this is where ethics makes money for you, right? Yeah. This is where, you know, doing the right thing, right? Yeah. Doing good, right? Yeah. It gets you to a lot more wealth and prosperity than, the short game of, because it's just, it's just ruinous. That's, I mean, I think one of the, the challenges Starbucks and the reason they were going to the the stock buyback to raise up the, the stock price because they were dealing with some harder times. And so what's your approach to dealing with harder times in your country? Leaning in, making sure you're doing the right thing by the folks that support your company or some other thing that just doesn't, it doesn't make sense in the long term. And I think it's great having this these kinds of discussion because as an entrepreneur, if you're in that position, as a manager, if you're in that position, it can really sharpen the lens on what the right thing to do in that moment is if you're sitting there looking through the 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 long term goal vision versus, you know, I need to solve somebody's issue that they have today. Yeah. And I think it speaks to, if you think about two words, whether you're an entrepreneur or a CEO of a huge company, I think there's two words that come to mind when we're talking about this. And one would be creativity and one would be sustainability. So for example, we need to be sustainable, whether it's as an individual or as a company or whatever. So that doesn't mean people only, right? It doesn't mean profits only. And that's why I think it's both because sustainably you have to make a profit or you can't keep the people there. I get it, right? So you need both. And then the creativity part comes in when you think about when times do get tough, right? Like I think if, I hope I don't butcher this, but I think it was Gary Ridge. Um, I think he's a CEO or was of WD-40. He's just one example of a poster child CEO that I, I think about a lot. And he's been written about a lot. And, you know, it's like, I think him. And then also I think somebody from, Patagonia. And then I think there's a few other companies where I've heard these case studies where it's like they did fall upon tough times over the years at different points in time, but they got creative, right? They said, well, either we could lay off, you know, 25% of our people, or let's have an open discussion with our people. Oh my God. And guess what? We're going to ask them for ideas. And what would you do? The ideas that, fl that came out of that were huge about how to innovate and how to do this and how to do that. And what they ended up doing was saying, we won't lay anybody off what we're going to do is different people would volunteer. Like, so for example, maybe Bob over here is like, Hey, you know what? I, I don't have a family or anything. I don't need the extra money. I'll volunteer a portion of my payment or my, my salary for like a month or whatever. Or this person would take a voluntary sabbatical unpaid for three months because they, their husband had a better paying job or whatever. But the point is they got really creative and they co-created with their people to find the solution to these tough time problems where nobody has to lose and everybody's involved and everybody feels good about it. I don't mind taking a pay cut for three months if I know that I don't have to have five of my colleagues laid off and then I have that survivor guilt. You know what I mean? So I think if you think about those things, there's a win, win, win all the way around if you get creative and you kind of get outside the typical short game thinking. Yeah. I think we're going to hear a lot of those stories as we're climbing out of the pandemic and mm -hmm. you know, going through the, the, the change chaos that, that we're all going through. I think you're going to hear lots of stories. We've certainly heard some of the stories of what people have done in order to make sure that, that people were taken care of, that the company survived. Um, you know, I, I know for my part, it was really tough making some of the decisions that we had to make 
because you just don't have the same revenue coming in. So like, how do you support your people? Do you keep them together? Do you spend time on things? Do you quit altogether? And so it really does rock you and it does, it does, you know, makes you really, how ethical am I going to be? How am I going to support my people? It makes you make really some tough decisions. And I know for me, trying to get my people together on Zoom was, was tough. And, you know, for, for me, just, it was emotional. Uh, it was it was something that wasn't wasn't the easy thing to do. And so, you know, how do you respond as a leader? Do you do the easy thing or do you, you know, just just swallow it and <laughs> get, yeah. get through it? You take take on the tough challenge and, and roll up your sleeves and get to it. And I think that kind of grit and thing is, you know, part of what it is to be an entrepreneur, a business leader is, you know, you got to. You know, if you're going to be here for the good times, you got to be here for the bad times, too, and take care of folks as you do it. All right. So let's get into this last piece. Right. So I think, you know, I love I love what we talked about and, you know, the employee experience. Right. How do we how do we create an employee experience? I know for myself, you know, I have in 2019, I had 130 part-time employees. And that means there's a lot of people in the field, like a lot of companies these days, um, that have a lot of people that aren't reporting to a headquarters. So uh, there's no swanky Google Plex or, or, or uh, you know, fancy office, you know, that they're necessarily reporting to. They're going out, they're doing basic, essentially gig work in one aspect or another. Uh, you got big companies delivering, a lot of people reporting, going out into the field, not necessarily uh, with the CEO, with even their their direct manager for a lot of time, and then you got other people that are spending a lot of time with their managers. How do we improve the employee experiences across the board? Yeah, it's a great question. And again, it, it was one thing before COVID, right? But now, especially because of the hybrid working and that sort of thing, one thing I hear a lot of from leaders is they're like, well, we got to get people back to the office because without the office, we don't have a culture. We don't have employee experience. But that's because they think employee experience and culture is like taco Tuesdays in the office and foosball tables in an office. That's not employee experience. It's not culture. Um, People need to understand, I think that employee experience and culture can be done anywhere, number one. Um, I would argue that it actually can be done better remotely if you do it right, because you have to be extremely deliberate about every single touch point and every single piece. And it's a very holistic, all-encompassing strategic lever you pull. It's not just like a one-off program or one-off thing. And so what I would say is, if you want to know, break it down super simply, what it is, is it's meeting people's key human needs and minimizing points of friction so that they can do the best work of their lives and drive your organization forward. And so this is, this means that whether you're remote or you're in the office, you're hybrid, you're on a beach, doesn't matter. You know, people have the necessary technology. They have the processes in, and space, again, whether it's at home or it's in the office to do their job, right? To do their actual work. And so in a, in a hybrid world, it also needs to be a seamless, equitable experience. So for example, if I am fully remote, and I'm in this person over here is in the office, we need to feel like we have an equitable experience, not that this person gets more face time with the leaders because they're in the office and I don't. And when we're on calls together with the group, one way to get around this is if there's even one person in the meeting that's not there physically in the office, then everybody should be bringing their laptop and have the cameras on in the meeting so that we're interacting this way and with the camera versus side conversations over here or whatever, just to make sure there's an equitable experience. So that's a new consideration now when we talk about hybrid. Um, also, you want to have the right culture and the right practices in place. Again, this whole COVID thing was not ideal, right? So all the things that we had to do and we did, we had to do them and that's we didn't know any better. I, I don't say me because I have been work, working remotely for like 10 years, but in general, people didn't know what to do. So they just did whatever was easy or whatever they thought made sense, which is fine. But now we can be delivered. We can do it the right way. We can have the culture in place and all the norms and all those things that make it operationalized. And then finally, I always argue there needs to be great change management for any changes that are happening in the organization at any time. And this is something that people don't often remember to include in the employee experience. But think about as an employee, your experience is every minute you are in contact with the organization, right? So it's not just once I get onboarded, it is 
before I even work for your company. When I'm looking at Glassdoor and thinking, hmm, what do I know about this brand? What do I know about that company? That's part of the employee experience. It's the interviewing, it's the onboarding, it's developing you while you're there. It's your whole day-to-day -day experience with your manager. It's whether you get promoted, whether there's you know all kinds of different factors that we can dive deeper into, but like the, it's every touch point and every moment that matters and whether or not the organization meets that with or without friction. And then even after you offboard your people and their alumni, you know, the best referrals can come and even Boomerang employees is from having a great employee experience because then they always have you in mind as a great brand, a great place to work, et cetera. So people need to realize it's a lot more holistic in nature than they think it is. And it also is more deliberate and it's strategic, but you have to do it right. And the other part is it's happening all the time, right? So culture and employee experience are happening all the time. They're evolving all the time, moment to moment, day to day. And so if you're not deliberate about it, if you're not constantly assessing and evolving it as you go, as people come and go in the organization, as things change, it's going to get stale. It's going to be non-relevant and or it's going to be not productive for people and not help them. And that's why you're going to see a lot of attrition. So at a very high level, that is what I would think of as employee experience. I love that. And Jason commented, love that. Rally your folks. Ideas can come, but the morale stays high. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I, I, I love what you said about remote work being something of um, a streamlining tool if, if you're utilizing it right, because it's so true. I know from my own office, getting focused on the tools and access that somebody needs to be able to have. And it's 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 a challenge in, in an office when you're setting somebody up on a computer and giving them access to all the tools that you use. It's a whole other thing when they're outside of the office. And so really getting down to, you know, is this a necessary function? Is this a necessary thing? Is there an easier way to do it? Is there a more streamlined way to do it? Is there a way that, you know, I know for, for me, you know, I've just recently incorporated Google Forms into our phone interviewing process. So now, because I'm a, I have a staffing company, so it's very interview heavy, just not losing people's information, right? So yeah. before we would do stuff manually, I had, you know, little cut pieces of paper that we- No, <laughs> post-its. I mean, it was, it was a little better than post-its. So, you know, oh a little my bit God. Of on it and all, all that, but you know, you're writing stuff down because you know, that was what was easy for me. I, you know, yeah. a phone call, pull the piece of paper, get the necessary information, take that, put it into the, you know, the email process. But of course, what happens? You lose it. And by the way, now with the Google Doc, you can not only have it all in one place and it's saved, but you can actually be collaborating. So if you had a partner that was in the interview as well, you guys could be writing notes in the same document and it's saved at the same time. Yeah. So I mean, it, the, the functionality, like you're saying, it, it just, by incorporating that and by by getting to that place, you're able to really, I mean, it's definitely revolutionized some of the things that we've done within the office because it's like, why didn't we, why weren't we doing things like this before? You know, now an email, a phone number that would have potentially gotten lost or miswritten yep. and so misinterpreted right? We're typing it. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not as easy. It's not as convenient as just scribbling down on the thing, but then on the back end, it takes less time because we're not hunting down information. I'm not handing it off to somebody that's like, oh my goodness, what the hell did you just write? Right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of streamlined pieces of it. So such an amazing uh, piece of the puzzle when you do transition to getting people out of the office because it makes you rethink all your processes and systems that you had uh, before. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of the results that you've seen. I, I don't know if you can tell us a story kind of to, to kind of wrap things up here with, you know, maybe coming into an organization and they were doing X, Y, Z before and you were able to sort of get management into a place where they were treating a little bit better. Do you have a story like that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to pick one, right? But I think I, I'll share one that kind of encapsulates a lot of the work that, that I do. Um, a lot of the times I'll get called in when there's been a merger, an acquisition, a reorg, things like that. And so there's one client in particular I'm thinking of right now where they went through um, 
they went, okay, so they had basically accumulated several different organizations over the course of several years under one like holding company. And they all ran very separately, very siloed, different platforms, different technology, different cultures, different everything and a lot of redundancy, right? Because each of those businesses had a sales team, each of them had an IT department, you know, all the, and so on and so forth. And so then they said, okay, well, we want to, you know, kind of consolidate everything. And so we have, you know, basically we need to get rid of do a reorg, get rid of some redundancies, save money, find efficiencies and all that. And so I was brought in to do the people and the change and the experience and the culture side of that work. And it was really, um, it was really difficult because they had done so many things wrong in the beginning by not communicating or communicating one thing and then changing their mind and communicating something else right away. And so basically the organization had eroded so much trust that people were not trusting and people were leaving left and right, etc. So they brought me in and they said, what do we do? We need to get rid of these silos. We need to like build trust again. We need to whatever. And so some of the things that we did in that regard was a lot of the times I'll start my work with like, what's that current state, understanding exactly what's going on, doing that through interviews, surveys, maybe employee data, employee experience data, employees um, engagement data, again, traveling around and meeting with the leaders and finding out their perspective, meeting with folks on the ground, doing some focus groups and really getting kind of like that holistic view of, you know, the person who brought me in thinks this is the problem or this is what's going on, but let's find out what's really going on beneath the surface, right? So digging into that, understanding what those themes are, what's really going on is my first step. And then from there, taking, you know, thinking about all the changes that are going to happen with the reorg or any kind of change that you're going to be doing and really building what I would call kind of like a change impact profile. So thinking about every single persona or stakeholder group or type of person or whatever, however you want to build those out um, in the organization and then running through this exercise and an analysis of exactly how they're impacted, what's changing for them, when it's changing, how it's changing, what they need, what we need from them, what they're going to need to be successful. That could be training and communications and maybe they need this, or, you know, all those different levers that we can talk about um, in building that impact assessment. So you get a really full picture of what's going on. And then with that, like I said, building personas, journey mapping people. And so I pull a lot of design principles into my work. So you're really thinking about it almost like when you think about marketing and, and sales and how you're um, spending a lot of time on your customer experience and understanding your customer and what's important to them and all those different channels. You do those exact same activities for your people and all the different people in your organization. And so in that way, you get to know them very well. You can personalize any change or any situation very well for them. And in particular, this example specifically, um, leaders didn't have a very good window into what people were actually thinking. They thought they did and they always think they do, but they usually don't have a real pulse on it. And so with that regard, we were able to really understand what was most important to people, what would make them stay, what would rebuild trust. And we built this really robust um, change champion, I'll call it network. Like it was like a lot of different nodes across the organization and network and cohorts and getting them to really co-create and build the new organization with us and build that new integrated vision, mission values. Because when you have such a fragmented organization like that, if you want to build trust and rally people, you need to get as broad and big an umbrella as you possibly can of a very broad vision that everybody can rally under. Because if you've got nine different companies, you need to get to the top of all of them. What do they all have in common? What is that bold vision at the very, very, very top that they can be part of? And so with that, again, bringing them into co-create with you, finding out what's important to them and giving them a stake in it, right? Like a skin in the game, essentially. And then they're much more bought in. They're much more committed because they helped you build it. And so when it's time to implement it or launch it or roll it out, they're already on board and they've already kind of bought themselves into it. So we use that um, in that and then a very robust change of communications plan and lots of bi-directional feedback mechanisms. I think a lot of organizations just think, oh, we're going to send a memo. We're going to send a survey. And they don't really do anything about it. It's not a bi-directional conversation. It's just kind of like, blah, we're going to put this out there. No, it needs to be, especially with today's generation, it needs to be very bi-directional, very iterative, real time, and like an You're ongoing building, conversation. Building a system or process, right? Yeah. You know, for me, you know, as a smaller company, because you're, I mean, you're definitely talking on large scale company, you're talking yep. about mergers, acquisitions, that sort of thing. But even on a on a small company frame all right an employee offers you feedback what do you do with it yeah. and so you you want to have a system in place for how to actually take that record it document it not react to it right respond to it mm -hmm. so that you can actually better the company better the employee and if there's something that you know is actionable in terms of you know this is going to make experience better for other employees, experience better for customers that, you know, by all means that you can actually incorporate that going forward. Um, it's such a big, big, big deal because now 
now you're getting, you know, for that entrepreneur that was like, why don't they have the same hustle that I have? Why don't they? That's it, right? That's what you want people to do. You want people to provide that feedback. That's the care. That's, that's what you want. And if you don't allow that channel, right, yeah. you are, you are killing your, your company probably faster yeah. rather than slowly. Right. And well, like, and some leaders, a lot of leaders actually think too, to that point, they think that, um, um, they, they, they'll ask for the feedback, but they won't do anything about it. Or they think that if I can't take an action on it, I don't want to address it. But no, you need to just get out there and say as a leader, and I would say this is a, if you have a company of one person or a thousand people, mm. you need to be comfortable saying, I don't have the answer. You guys said you wanted this. We are not going to do that, but here's why. And you just tell them why. Because I think Tony Shea said this at one point. He said, you know, not everybody gets a say, but everybody gets to have a say or something like that. Or, you know what I mean? So it's like, we're going to listen to you and we may action on it. We may not, but if we don't, we'll let you know why. And we want the conversation to continue. And so that's the other thing too, with changes if leaders will wait till the very last minute to communicate anything or they won't at all. It's okay to give bad news. People don't care if you give them bad news. They just want you to be frank with them and tell them as soon as possible. So that's the thing that I think a lot Jason, of people get wrong. Jason Croft was in the comments here, and we had a show uh, last week, and we were talking about you know you can you can choose to be a part of the conversation or you can choose not, but that that choice is a choice, right? And yes. so and and both of those choices, communicating or not communicating, sends a message. You're communicating, yeah. <laughs> and so. You know, that, that is true for everything. And so when you don't communicate with the staff, when, I mean, I, to me, it's it's very difficult to get staff to provide feedback a lot of times. You have to, I mean, it takes a lot of work. So when yeah. you get somebody that's actually doing it, it's such a blessing. The last thing you want to do is is ignore it or make it seem like it was ignored because that's the, that's the, behavior you want to encourage within your organization is a constant uh, feedback loop where you're getting systems to be refined. I love the um, the Japanese uh, system for uh, building, you know, oh, Ford, Kaizen, right? Right. So you have Ford yeah. that, you know, built the the automation uh, factor, right? You have have that, you know, going on. And then Japan took that step further where, you know, anybody can stop the line so that they can refine it, which, you know, what we did, we, we kind of kept on even uh, past that innovation, but anybody could stop the line so that they could fix the thing. So at the end, there was less, so it would seem uh, less productive in the short run, yeah. but in the long run, they're killing it, right? Because yeah. they're taking care of the issues along the way. And if you've got long-term goals and long-term visions, what better way? I mean, I think that sort of sums up what we've talked about. Take care of those those little issues uh, in the moment so that you can execute on that that long-term vision. This is this has been excellent. Uh, Tanil, tell everybody, obviously, people should be connecting with you on LinkedIn. Is there another place that you'd like them to find you? Uh, they can go to my website. It's just all one word, experienceandtransformation.com experience and transformation.com go check it out thank you so much i'm gonna let you have the last word to neil uh just final words of thought for doing well and optimizing a person's organization yeah i think just you know really playing the long game i would keep reiterating that same theme playing the long game thinking creatively and just realizing there's a win-win all around you don't have to pick one or the other that's amazing thank you so much thank Everyone. you for having me oh you're very welcome Everyone, make sure you connect with Tanil. I'm looking forward to seeing some interactions and networking come out of this. I will see you tomorrow. Thanks, Tanil. Biz Dev Live, Biz Dev Live. Weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Live. Biz Dev Live, Biz Dev Live. Weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Leadership and motivation. Motivation. Empathy and inspiration. Inspiration. Biz Dev Live. Biz Dev Live. Business development, not even selling it. Biz D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T. Cameron T. Biz D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T. Cameron T. This is business development, not even selling it. Not even selling it. Not even selling this it. This is business development, not even selling it. Business development, not even selling it. Biz Dev Live. Biz Dev Live. Biz Dev Live.